Director of the Academy. And we'd like to thank you all for being here tonight uh, on this, such an important topic and one that we're thrilled uh, to present to you, uh, made possible by our supporter community. And if you're new to the Academy, it was started 15 years ago um, you know, by teachers as a way of teaching about the most important issues of our time, whether it be genocide in Darfur or the warming of the planet. It's our hope both for programs for teachers and students that the world can become a better place and people can use their talents to chip in on the solutions. So as far as a brief introduction goes, last time we were with you, um, it was uh, several weeks ago uh, to talk about the crisis in Ukraine. And it's been really heartening to see the response of the teacher community. And you know, given the fact that we have roughly 10 weeks left in the school year here in New York State at least, you know, we encourage you to use the educator resources on the Academy's website that Katie's gonna plug in the chat in a second and to possibly have uh, a walkathon. And, you know, we know that Chris uh, and, and uh, uh, Justine did at Hamburg with great results. And, you know, we had one at Springville and these are, are really uh, great situations that inspire our students, not just admire the problems of the world, but to in some way be part of the solution. So, you know, uh, hit us up privately if you need a nudge on that, but, the permission slip is in the Academy's webpage that Katie will be sharing. The big news promotionally for us is that we went live with the 15th uh, Summer Symposium, which was formerly called the Summer Institute for Human Rights and Genocide Studies. Now it's just called the Symposium, which is far cooler. And you see this uh, beautiful poster here entitled Not Found in Textbooks, meaning that the, you know, the, the symposium will be looking at the topics that maybe you want to teach about, but don't have time or feel constrained by the you know, uh, constraints of your curriculum. And you see the oversized map of Africa by conventional standards, but in reality, you know, it's proportionate. These are small but important issues that we, we're gonna try to you know, uh, share with roughly 75 young people from all over Western New York. But to do that, we need your help. So in the next few weeks, you're gonna be getting postcards and emails from us to share with those students who you feel that, you know, would be a great fit. Uh, the symposium is gonna be back live at, with our great friends at Erie One BOCES uh, between July 11th and the 16th. There will be an online component for students who need it. And we'll figure that out when we get closer, but we're hoping we can depend upon you to share this, this life-changing program with the kids who you're close with. Now, to combine human rights with education with alcohol, um, seeing that most of you are teachers and we call alcohol vitamins, right? Uh, the Academy is going to have its uh, uh, spring promotional event and fundraiser event at the Southern Tier Brewery Company uh, coming up a week from tomorrow. And with a donation of $50, you get uh, two beverages of your choice and a heavy hors d'oeuvre bar. And, you know, we're really looking forward to it. Now, the, the Southern Tier Brewery is the old 716 Club that's part of Harbor Center. Um, there's parking garage that's right there, so you can just zip in the parking garage and walk right in like, you know, you're a rock star. And, you know, we can't wait to see all of you and feel comfortable. Of course, we're going to be following, you know, the COVID protocols, and we encourage people to mask to their comfort level. And we're going to be monitoring the situation carefully, uh, you know, just to make sure that we're hitting all the right notes for public health. But we're really excited about it, and we hope you are too. And um, the tickets can be purchased online or in person right at the door. And, you know, if everybody on the screen came with, you know, their, their partner or friend or, you know, combination, you know, we'd be thrilled because this, you know, supports this nonprofit organization that we hope is, is a big part of your life. And, you know, we can't thank you enough for, you know, thinking about it. And hopefully we'll see you there. Now to our supporters on the screen, you know, thank you for making tonight possible. And I always try to end my remarks with the impact of the donations on our student community. And we had 45 teachers registered and, you know, hopefully all those people will come tonight, but assuming that they did and assuming that they teach 125 students each, this webinar reaches a student audience of 5,000 students this year alone. And, you know, for those of you who are interested in making a donation to the Academy, you can do so on our webpage. For those of you who already have, thank you. You're awesome, we love you. And we're so thankful to partner with you to make these important messages 
um, that you're going to hear tonight from our speaker, Adam Possible. So with that said, um, our speaker, Adam Latz, is a member of the tribe. And what I mean by that is not only does he have a PhD from Wisconsin Madison, but he taught um, to middle school and, and high school. And you know he gets the pressures that we face on a very personal level. And when I read his article in Slate a couple of months ago talking about how teachers are under attack and that this has a historical foundation and that we can do something about it, I knew that you would welcome this message as well. So Adam, uh, on behalf of the Academy and our board and staff and all the people on the screen, uh, welcome to the family. And we're so proud to be with you tonight and to hear your important message. Uh, well, thank you very much, Drew. And, and uh, nice to meet everybody. Um, I, I don't know if, if all of you in Buffalo know this, but Binghamton, we just had uh, not just one snow day yesterday, but all the schools were closed again today after 14 inches of, of April snow. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm at the university now, so um, I, didn't, I didn't get those days off, but my wife uh, got the days because, um, you know, they just don't have power. So I don't know how often Buffalo gets to look at other cities in New York and laugh, uh, but, but go ahead. Uh, you know, we got, it. We got a Whomper uh, the last couple of days. <laughs> this, was, uh, this was Binghamton's Buffalo moment maybe. But I am thrilled to be here. Uh, as Drew said, I'm a, I'm a um, former middle school and high school teacher from in Milwaukee. Um, now, uh, I, am a, 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 I teach history classes at Binghamton University, but the, I, I especially work with people who are planning to be teachers, uh, planning to be history teachers. And back when we had uh, Teaching American History grants, that was part of this position as well. I got to work with a lot of teachers uh, in the summer. Um, so I still get to go into schools uh, um, uh, and, and be part of history classes. But what I'd like to talk with you about tonight um, is more of the research that I've been doing over the past um, uh, decades about the history of the kinds of, you know, school culture wars we're seeing these days. Uh, and I do think that the history has lessons, not just for um, historians, but for, for citizens and especially for teachers as well. So I'd like, as Drew mentioned, I'd like to point to some of uh, what I think are the sort of takeaways of how historically these kind of battles have been won and lost um, and what, uh, what it's meant for teachers. So I'd like to start with, um, I've been, um, I don't know what the right word is, I've been uh, meditating, uh, reading, and rereading. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to share my screen. I, I already did this with uh, Drew, I apologize. I'm out of Zoom shape. Um, all right, here we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, uh, so as I said, I've been, I've been spending a lot of time with two books uh, that both happen to be uh, they both happen to be from 1936. The first one um, is, is this one. Uh, Howard Beale, who was a historian in 1936, he was um, hired, uh, commissioned by the American Historical Association to study the state of teachers, K-12 teachers. And um, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a little grim, uh, his results. So on the one hand, for example, he, he uh, found, or dis this was one of his conclusions, that in the schools, 1936, uh, in the schools, patriotism is usually confused with extreme nationalism. It has sought to force teachers to admit or distort all facts of history that do not glorify the nation. And then specifically, for those of you who are social studies teachers out there, he looked at history classrooms and, and he found restraints are frequently put upon teachers of history. Special groups actively seek to make history teaching serve particular ends. So for the last uh, you know, a couple of years, as these um, school board battles and textbook battles and 1619 project and 1776 curriculum projects, as these have been in the headlines, I spent some time with, with, with Howard. Um, and it's a little uh, grim in some ways to find that you know, he, when he studied the state of teaching in 1936, well, in 1935, he, in 1936, he published these, um, very 2022 sounding uh, results about what was going on for teachers and the state of what it meant to be a teacher in the United States during the, during, uh, the 1930s. So that's the first book 
that I've been spending time with. The second book um, is a series of essays by the novelist Willa Cather. Um, and she also came out in 1936. The, the book is called Not Under 40. And the reason that I, I cracked it open uh, was because I, I remember there's, a, there's one line of hers that really sticks with me. Um, and it's this line. Uh, 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 Cather wrote in, in 1936, uh, the world broke apart in 1922 or thereabouts. And the reason that line has stuck with me so uh, much uh, over the last few years is I've been thinking about the headlines about what teachers have, are going through and what school board members are going through and what you know authors of kids' books are going through um, is because I think it really captures that this what we're experiencing now is uh, it's been going on for a hundred years and it's the result of what happened in the U.S. in the 1920s. Not, uh, it's been, it's since then, there's been uh, uh, a difficult to pin down, but really a fundamental transformation in, in American society that's been continuing this whole time. And I don't know what to call it exactly. Um, I don't want to be too optimistic about it or sound too optimistic about it, but I think generally in 1922 or thereabouts, the world broke apart uh, in the United States. The, the expectation for uh, some people that they would be the ones who counted as the real Americans. In 1922, that broke apart. In 1922 um, or thereabouts, the expectation that only white Christian, uh, maybe heterosexual, but definitely nuclear family uh, people, uh, that expectation that they were the only real Americans really did start to break apart in 1922. Um, it, it obviously, it's, um, it's not you know, a, a finished transformation, but I think the idea of what America, what real America is, has been transforming for a hundred years in the direction of a more inclusive, uh, more uh, heterogeneous, more diverse kind of attitude of what it means to be a real American. Obviously, it's not finished, but I think for a hundred years we've been the United States has been moving in that direction. And what I'd like to share with you is some of the ways uh, that Americans have tried to sort of cram it back together. Uh, certain conservatives for a hundred years have tried to cram it back together. And the thing that this has to do with us as teachers and with schools in general is that like Willa Cather said, it's really hard. It's always been for a hundred years, it's been hard for people to pin down exactly what's changed, um, but they've felt it. It's been a sort of tectonic change in society uh, in terms of who counts as the real America. Um, and what has happened over and over again is that as society has changed, as the Supreme Court outlaws legal segregation in schools, as the Supreme Court uh, rules against um, you know, Christian prayer or the Lord's Prayer as part of public education, uh, as more recently uh, the Supreme Court uh, realized the same sex or agrees that same sex marriage is you know, a right. Uh, as the US sort of mainstream has moved in this direction, people keep trying to push the world back together, that old world back together. And instead of understanding that it's changing in general, what's happened over and over again is that conservatives, as they try to cram things back into the bottles, they try to you know, remake uh, um, uh, the world as it used to be, because it's such a vague and difficult change, what they've done as they looked around, instead of trying, instead of being able to figure out the complexities, is that they have looked and found a culprit. And the culprit that they've found for a hundred years now has been teachers. Over and over again, from the 1920s till today, confronted with social change, confronted with a changing mainstream that has grown more and more inclusive, more and more diverse, more and more accepting of you know, a variety of, of meanings of, of what it means to be American, as that's happened slowly and, and up, you know, back and forth in zigzag pattern over a century, conservatives have looked and found uh, someone to blame, and that person has been teachers. So I'd like to share some examples, and, uh, and we'll open up to talk about, you know, different uh, experiences and uh, people have had. 
But the, the first example, and I think it's the one that um, is the most drastic, was in the 1920s. Uh, when you look at the 1920s, this was a real culture war for schools, a real war that conservatives had, uh, um, you know, more than a, a, a fair chance of winning. And the leading group in the 1920s that tried to fuse America back into one piece, their piece, was a group we, you're all familiar with. Um, it was the Ku Klux Klan in the 20s, which, as those of you who are history teachers know, in the 20s, uh, the Klan was a very uh, different group than the later ones. In the 1920s, there were millions of members. It, um, it was a relatively, I mean, it was still violent, it was still racist, it was anti-Catholic, it was anti-Semitic, it was bigoted, um, but it was also distressingly um, popular and mainstream. Millions of members, it was a Main Street organization, uh, even though it stood explicitly for ideas like white supremacy. So one of the things that the, that the Klan did in the 1920s, they were very interested in schools, and this, uh, this picture is Bowling Green, Ohio, 1928. One of the things the local groups would do is they would donate uh, flags and Bibles to their public schools. And this is a, a flag raising ceremony at a public school in Bowling Green, Ohio. Um, so the Klan was very uh, uh, active in local school politics, but that wasn't it. They also wanted to take over uh, the nation's public schools as a whole. So the leader in, 19, in the 1920s, a man named Hiram Evans, he proposed, uh, it might be a surprise, but as a leading conservative in the 1920s, he proposed a huge funding increase for public schools. Uh, $1920, he wanted $100 million of new federal funding to public schools, dished out by a new, they didn't have a Department of Education. He wanted a Department of Education that would have this huge burst of new funding. And that part comes as a surprise. What he thought it would do is less of a surprise. This is, this is his plan. He wanted public schools. He wanted to take over public schools so that they would, um, and this is the quote that always sticks with me, they would take every child in America and put him in the public school of America. We will build a homogenous people. We will grind out Americans like meat out of a grinder. So to me, to my mind, this is a conservative attempt to, you know, take that world that broke apart and cram it back together with force, but also with money, $100 million of federal funding to uh, boost public education so that every kid could be uh, Americanized the way the Ku Klux Klan wanted them to. Um, and they, they did other things as well. They, most um, uh, distressingly for our politics, they ran school board candidates all over the country and they won. So uh, one case that we know about just by accident was in uh, LaGrande, uh, LaGrande, Oregon. The school, uh, the, the Klan took over the school board and they tried to fire a teacher for, for being Catholic. Um, they, uh, at the time in Klan ideology, the Catholic church was a huge force undermining America by undermining public schools. This is a, a, a pamphlet from 1922 from Oregon by the Oregon Klan. And you can see here, the, they have the, the Catholic bishop who is happily because he just burned down the public school. The children are crying. These guys in top hats, they are supposed to represent the, um, the different Protestant denominations. And they had, in the other address of the pamphlet, they had been fighting amongst themselves. And meanwhile, the, the Catholic bishop snuck in and burnt down the school. So this was the Klan line um, in the 1920s. And in addition to uh, a, a Department of Education, the Klan in the 1920s tried to ban private schools. Uh, in Oregon, they passed a law banning private schools. They were targeting Catholic schools. 14 other states had similar bills in the 1920s pushed by the Klan into state legislatures. Um, so this is a real push in the 1920s to take over public schools, to force the, a broke apart world back together, to grind out a certain kind of Americans like meat out of a grinder. That's what they were trying to do. Uh, they had their own textbook as well, their history textbook. The Story of Our American People was a, a book pushed by the Klan to tell a heroic history. Uh, but, but here's the thing. 
Uh, all of these schemes were real attempts to actually take over uh, the nature and transform the nature of public schools. Um, none of them worked. Uh, the American Legion uh, came out against that textbook. They were very conservative as well, very patriotic as well, but they studied that textbook and they said, it's just bad. Uh, we don't support it. And they had funded it to begin with. Uh, not just that, the Supreme Court threw out the um, Oregon law against Catholic schools. Um, the, the, the Department of Education never happened. In general, the 1920s Klan failed at all of these attempts to take over America's public schools. But what sticks with me is that the, the Klan attempt to fuse the world back together failed, but teachers still paid the price. Teachers like Evelyn Newland in LaGranda, Oregon, who kept her job in the end, but she was fired and had to fight for it. And she did nothing wrong. She's a good teacher. She was only fired, targeted because she was Catholic. Um, so this is one example to me of these attempts to use schools to cram a, a, a fractured a world back together. Uh, jumping uh, to World War II, during World War II, teachers and history textbooks again came under fire. It was a very popular set of middle school texts, the, the most popular, millions of copies sold by a guy from um, a Teachers College, Harold Rugg. Um, and these textbooks were accused of, as you might guess, undermining traditional American values. This is an American Legion cartoon that is accusing the Rugg textbooks of you know, boring from within, subverting American uh, ideals in children's minds. Um, here in Binghamton uh, is actually uh, two days ago, I mean, 82 years ago, two days ago, 81 years ago, two days ago, that the, uh, uh, the school board, three members of the school board agreed to have a bonfire of these history textbooks. It didn't happen, but it did happen in other cities like uh, Marshfield, Wisconsin burnt its rug textbooks. Um, so uh, if you're like me, you wanna know what the problem is. Um, the textbooks were accused of being anti-American, anti-patriotic. Um, at the time they were accused of being sort of socialist um, stocking horses sneaking socialist ideas into American history. So for example, one of the biggest foes of the textbook was uh, Bertie Forbes, the guy who started Forbes magazine. And he um, got himself onto the school board in Englewood, New Jersey. And he, made, he was a syndicated columnist. Um, he made this his main cause, he's fighting these rug textbooks. And he told the story over and over. He had a, a very popular column. He told the story over and over again of what he thought was wrong. So he said that he visited a, a middle school, a junior high at the time, and this is 1940, talked to students about their books, and this is what one group of students told him. Uh, they said that their teacher had asked them if the government of the United States was or was not better than other governments. And some students said that the United States was the best. And according to Forbes, their teacher was reading from the rug textbook, the teacher's guide, and said, uh, no, the correct reply is no. Uh, quote, there are several other countries that have as good a form of government as ours. Um, so what happened with the rug textbooks, in some ways, this conservative campaign to uh, fight off ideas that suggested that there were problems in America, in some ways it worked. The books really did get effectively banned. Um, they went from millions of sales to zero in just a short 1939 to 1941. But here's the thing. The books that schools used uh, instead were pretty much the same. You know, the world already broke apart. All the textbooks were saying the same things, not all of them, but most of the leading textbooks by leading publishers were saying very similar things. What Rugg was saying was, it was just social studies. It wasn't subversive, it wasn't socialist. The other books that the schools used had the same messages. Um, so in, in, in a sense, the, the campaign fizzled, and yet the whole time teachers felt attacked. They felt like, like the teacher that Forbes accused in the national newspapers of subverting her children's patriotism. Uh, next example, jumping again to the, the period of the second Red Scare, the early 1950s, and jumping out to California. Uh, Pasadena, California, then and now was a very wealthy uh, town in 1948. They needed a new superintendent, and so they went on the market. 
the national market. And they found a person whose credentials were, you know, he was the, he had been a very successful superintendent outside of St. Louis, Twin Cities. He was the head of the national superintendent, whatever association. And they hired him. And he came in on a promise to make their schools the most modern, uh, you know, the best funded, the best public schools in the nation in Pasadena, California. That's what they wanted. That's what he promised. And he thought that one of the ways to do it was to use a lot more of, you know, pro, quote unquote, progressive pedagogy, literally quote, that's what he called it. That's what everyone called it. And it includes stuff uh, that, you know, we still consider somewhat, you know, non-traditional. So not just lectures and, and rote memorization, but, you know, kids would work on projects. Uh, kids would go on field trips. Uh, for example, uh, something that still is considered pretty uh, progressive, Goslin got rid of report cards. Instead of grades, teachers would write um, narrative about how students were doing. Uh, Goslin set up vertical groups, uh, a teacher, a staff member, an administrator, a parent, and then a non-parent citizen. And these groups were supposed to meet occasionally and talk about the town, the school, um, uh, he, um, oh yeah, he, uh, maybe most important, he rezoned Pasadena so that one middle school that had been almost exclusively white would be mixed, uh, Latinx, black, uh, and white in the new zones. And uh, he came under attack for all these things, but all these things were labeled as a, uh, uh, an attempt to sneak socialism, this is 1949, 1950, to sneak socialism into the schools of Pasadena under the cover of progressive pedagogy, under the cover of, you know, modern teaching. And so obviously there's no internet, but the pamphlets at the time are just, um, you know, ruthless. Uh, so for example, uh, a guy named Alan Zoll was a, uh, um, uh, right-wing pamphleteer. He had a huge mailing list, very well-read. And the folks in Pasadena who kicked out, oh, sorry, I forgot the, <laughs> the exciting conclusion. Pasadena kicked out Willard Gosling after only 18 months on the job. They, they voted him out. They fired him. They, he got a settlement. He was fine. But they fired him for these charges of being a progressive educator. And the, the reason that the pro, being a progressive educator was seen as so dangerous is stuff like what Alan Zoll was circulating among parents uh, and activists in Pasadena, like this pamphlet, uh, Progressive Education Increases Delinquency. And no surprise, teachers are targeted. Here, uh, I don't, it's a Groucho Marx teacher late. It's, I, <laughs> it's, the art isn't great. Uh, she's chopping down the American way of life, honor, truth, justice, loyalty, and order. She's destroying everything that people value. Uh, and she's doing it, this teacher, uh, under the guise of progressive education. Now, in this pamphlet, what Zoll says is that um, at best, at best, the teachers who do progressive uh, pedagogy, the best they can claim is that they're dupes, that they didn't know what they were doing. Um, most of them, though, according to this, this right-wing pamphleteer, Alan Zoll, most of the teachers did know. Most teachers were plotting actively to cut down the American way of life. And this is what he said would happen. This is the a quote from this same pamphlet. It was going to create, quote, a tragically misshapen generation without the ability to think for themselves, filled only with the desired herd ideas, fit only to be citizens of the authoritarian state. So again, um, what Goslin brought in was group projects, field trips, um, you know, things like that rezoning, uh, no report cards, and what he was accused of is doing all that only to bring down uh, American greatness. Uh, outside of Pasadena at the time, this is a very widely distributed kind of idea among a certain type of uh, conservative activist. This is another, uh, this is not the same pamphlet, but a different one from 1949. Uh, here you see the depiction of teachers that was circulating so widely decency, honor, sincerity, and the teachers up there, you know, corny ideas, um, and the, the, the pamphleteer, it's high time for parents to take a closer interest in our schools. The accusation, once again, is that uh, teachers were subverting American values 
under the guise of you know, the most modern, the most progressive teaching. So, but here's the kicker to my mind. At the same time that these uh, that you know right-wing activists are circulating pamphlets like this, you know, on the on the 1940s equivalent of Breitbart and OANN and stuff. Uh, at the same time that that happens, there were some surveys of what Americans thought about, you know, public schools and progressive pedagogy. So, for example, one national survey, 1951 to 1952, one of the questions they asked was. Would you pay more taxes if necessary for high quality public schools? 1951, 1952, the same time Willard Gosset is getting fired in Pasadena, the same time these pamphlets are circulating accusing teachers of at best being you know, fools and following along with this plan this, to, to undermine America, but more likely being on board with it. So while all that is out there in the air, this survey asked people, would you pay more taxes? And 77% of people in 1951, 1952, 70, uh, sorry, 77% of respondents said, yes, I'd pay more taxes for public schools if, if necessary. 13% uh, said no, only 10% had no opinion. And, and specifically in Pasadena, where they're firing the, the superintendent, where they're accusing teachers of um, you know, trying to produce a tragically misshapen generation, the NEA did a survey just in Pasadena and they didn't use the word progressive pedagogy, but they asked everybody or not, they asked respondents about things like uh, group discussions, field trips, group projects. Do you favor these things in Pasadena school? So while Pasadena is uh, firing and attacking its superintendent and accusing its teachers, this is what they said that the past, same people said in surveys, um, Field trips, so the public as a whole, 92% of them wanted kids in schools to do field trips. 93% of respondents who had kids in the system were in favor of field trips as a way of learning. Uh, group projects, you know, the sort of quintessence of this 1950s progressive pedagogy. Group projects uh, with kids, 94.4% of parents with kids wanted uh, their kids to be doing exactly what they had fired the superintendent and accused teachers of, of pushing into their schools. So again, we see the pattern. Conservatives, um, they win in a way. Gosling got fired. Teachers got um, insulted and attacked, accused of being trying to produce a misshapen generation. And yet the public likes exactly what the teachers and superintendent were trying to bring to Pasadena schools. The field trips, the group discussions, non-traditional pedagogy, people liked it. What they didn't like was when they were told it meant that teachers were sneaking socialism in. All right, one more example from the past and then, and then we'll get to the 21st century, I swear. So last example from the past, we're jumping to the 1970s. Um, and in the 1970s in Kanawha County, West Virginia, is one, another one of these um, school controversies, book controversies, teacher controversies that gets national attention. And the White House gets involved. This was um, the very first uh, cause that the Heritage Foundation got involved in. Um, and it was a school boycott in uh, Kanawha County, which is uh, the county, uh, the state capital in Charleston. Um, and what happened was the, like a lot of states in West Virginia, the state adopted textbooks and then each school district, the school board could accept them or, or reject them, but it couldn't change them. So I, I listened to the audio tapes of the meetings, the school board meetings in Kanawha County in April, 1974. They're very boring. They're, everyone's getting along, you know, they're chuckling. Uh, they're, and they're just conducting business, you know, like all, I, all opposed, abstain. You know, it's the, in April of 1974, the school board meetings are very dull. They're just going over, you know, who, how the budget for the new bus approve, disapprove, you know, it's, but in June, 1974, uh, one of the members of the school board said, okay, these new textbooks, hold up. Alice Moore was the name of this uh, school board member, newly elected, recently moved to, to Charleston, West Virginia. And she was a conservative activist connected to national networks of conservatives. And she accused the textbooks of being 
anti-Christian, anti-white, anti-American, you know, anti-morality. And these are literature textbooks. Um, and she uh, says, if these textbooks are in the book, are in the schools, our kids are going to be indoctrinated into this wild, radical, you know, anti-American ideology. They're going to be reading things like Eldritch Cleaver, excerpts from Soul on Ice. They're going to be reading things like E.E. E. Cummings, I Like My Body. They're going to be reading things like Lawrence Ferlinghetti, uh, Christ Climbed Down, I think is his poem that was in there. Um, and so this, uh, she had one uh, ally on school board, but the school board disagreed, the rest of the board, and they approved the books. So these books are in the schools. Alice Moore starts a campaign against the books. And uh, it embroils the school for weeks in this boycott. The conservatives say, we are not going to let our kids go to school until these books are out. And that's where this sign comes from. I don't, I have a Bible. I don't need those dirty books. And it's violent. This is what gets the most attention. The school board building gets dynamited. Uh, no one was in there. Uh, so no one was hurt. But the school board building was dynamited. An elementary classroom was firebombed at night. School board, uh, school buses were, um, sniped a rifle shot as they as they brought kids to school because it was a boycott there's picket lines two people got shot not killed um and it was unclear who shot them it never it never got solved who shot them because it was a you know a violent tussle at the picket line uh so um as these as these fights are happening this is 1974 it seems a lot like 2021, 2022. This is a picture from uh, one of the tumultuous school board meetings. It was so packed. This is Alice Moore in the front that, you know, as you can see, people are, are squishing into the windows. They look like they're having a fine time. But I listened to the audio from here. Uh, right behind Alice Moore is uh, Anson, the, Albert Anson, the head of the school board chairperson. He's having a terrible time. He's having to bang his gavel. He's having to shout, having to shout for order. He's having to call for police to drag parents out who are yelling about these books. So again, this is 1974. It sounds awful similar to today, partly because we have these same similar themes. Um, uh, Alice Moore argued at the time and then in her reelection campaign, she, I know you can't read the, the print here, but I, 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 I blew it up. She ran and won in 1976 on this campaign to respect our rights as parents to be able to control what our kids are going to be exposed to as you know the ideas our kids are going to be exposed to if we don't want our children reading the work of black militant authors that should be our right alice moore says alice moore says i'm not racist uh, actually reading these uh black authors is going to turn our white kids into racists which again sounds very similar to some of the rhetoric these days and she wins uh in 1976 wins re-election but the, the campaign itself doesn't really win. The campaign, the books are in, the schools, the kids come back to schools. The compromise is that eight of the books, it's a, you know, it's a list of um, uh, literature books for middle schools and high schools. Eight of the books are on a list. Parents have to sign if their kids are gonna read those books. Um, okay, so this is the 20th century. I think uh, uh, the, the takeaway theme, at least for me, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, takeaway theme is there's this ongoing um, accusation against teachers um, and textbooks and superintendents, but especially against teachers of being the ones who are um, cramming these changes down kids' throats, when really the changes had happened before. Uh, you know, the, so for, for example, in Kanawha County, um, the, the textbooks had been adopted by the state. They were a standard set, the interaction series of, of mainstream literature textbooks. It wasn't that the teachers went out and, you know, got these radical texts. They were very, uh, you know, the books are uh, fairly um, humdrum, you know. They're, they're collections of, uh, of, of literature that try to be as diverse in 1974 terms as possible. Um, same thing in Pasadena. Uh, the the um, superintendent was making changes that were pretty um, non-objectionable. Uh, he was introducing things like uh, group discussions as classroom learning. 
introducing things that the community actually wanted. Uh, and yet uh, he became uh, the subject of attack. Um, the rug textbooks were replaced, but they were replaced with very similar books. Um, so over and over again, these attacks on schools are, in, in, a, in a big picture sense, they don't do anything because the schools aren't actually causing the changes. Schools are just sort of keeping up with the changing society. The things that are going into the textbooks are just the, the mainstream ideas. But conservatives in each case from the 1920s, the 1940s, 1950s, 1970s, in each case, they are accusing teachers of pulling in radical ideas and jamming them into kids in an unwanted way. So just for one example, um, not to get to 2022, but um, it, you may be following uh, different states uh, are, are talking about laws and bills that would have similar sort of restricting um, uh, approaches for schools. So in Florida, Governor DeSantis is pushing the or pushed the Stop Woke Act. Uh, and the, um, the quote from his commissioner of education, DeSantis' uh, commissioner of education, is that the reason this is necessary is that, and I'm quoting, uh, uh, our classrooms, students, and even teachers are under constant threat by critical race theory advocates who are, are attempting to manipulate classroom content into a means to impose one's values on students. So I heard that and I got curious. I looked at Florida's standards. So if you're a teacher in Florida, they have the sunshine standards. These are adopted in 2008. If you're a teacher in, New in Florida in the high school, you're supposed to teach students about freedom movements. Oops, sorry. Um, about freedom movements, about W.B. Du Bois, about Marcus Garvey. Uh, so when you hear the, gov when the governor passes a law uh, uh, about um, you know, ideas being crammed uh, down um, kids' throats, the constant threat of critical race theory advocates. As a teacher in Florida, you'd be forced to choose. Are, are you going to follow the new law? Are you going to follow the curriculum and the standards? Or is there, do you end up just following your conscience? It's very, it puts student teachers, as happened over and over again in the 20th century, teachers are forced to be in this vague and, and distressing middle ground where they're, they're under attack. The attack is vague. And it's about something that's bigger than the teachers or the textbooks are actually going to do. So I'll end with this. You may be familiar with this stuff. It's been, you know, people have been bandying these polls about lately. This is Gallup. Um, Gallup, just like Pasadena's parents liked progressive pedagogy, parents in general like excuse me, like their kids' public schools, the top green line, dark green, is if you have a kid in school, what do you grade that? Um, so between, you know, 65 and 77 percent of parents from the 80s to the 2010s um, give their kids' schools an A or a B. The bottom line is the nation's public schools. So in general, people say the nation's public schools are terrible. Very few people give them an A or a B. But when people know their public schools, when their kids are in those schools, uh, they trust those public schools. And I think that has always been the case. When people actually know what goes on in their schools, when people actually know their teachers, they trust them, they like them, they want more of it. They want higher quality textbooks. They want modern teaching methods. It's when they have this vague threat that they people tend to react angrily. So thank you. I'll stop talking, but I, I'd love to hear, uh, you know, your questions, your comments, your experiences. Um, and thank you again very much for having me. Yeah, thank you. That was itching where we're scratching here in, in so many ways, you know, because you're right, the, the past is, is very actively with us here. Um, so while, you know, everyone is digesting what you said, Adam, uh, we've got around uh, 10 minutes here for the formal webinar. And, you know, um, I'm sure if you're amenable, um, there'll be, you know, more than a few of us who will, will be hanging out for a few minutes after, if that's okay. But what does the past tell you about solutions? And, you know, what, how did the teachers under attack and what does your research show uh, or suggest how we should respond? 
um, mm -hmm. because we've all gotten those stinging emails um, from uh, you know a parent that you know tend to to have a half life of plutonium with us. Um, how should we be responding here? Should we be on offense, defense, mm -hmm. um, say nothing? What 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 what, yeah. what does your research tell you? Well, historically, what's worked is, is a little. Um, uh, it, 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 a little unsatisfying, I'm afraid. So um, historically what has worked are arguments for quality. So uh, an individual teacher, the parents want their kids to have a good quality education. Um, so in both in the big picture and the small picture. So like, for example, fighting against a law, um, uh, whether that law is against evolution or against uh, the teaching of, of real complicated history or um, you know, truly diverse literature. Uh, every time in the 20th century, it's what has won our arguments for quality, a high quality school, modern textbooks, modern teaching methods. So when you get, I don't know if this is the email level, but uh, in the big picture, what wins is quality. Uh, and I don't know if it's happened uh, to, to people in the, in the room, but I know when, when I was teaching high school history, and one parent complained that uh, we were talking about um, re uh, studying this uh, wars, uh, Vietnam wars. And, you know, students were reading um, about the My Lai massacre. And it's the only time a parent did this to me. But when we sat down and we went over what we were reading, you know, and, and you know, I showed them that there were students were reading letters and court records. In that case, he was like, yeah, I want my student to know all that. He thought I was out there telling his kids that, you know, there's only one way to look at this. And, you know, there's only, you know, uh, you, can, you can only see the United States as a sort of genocidal, everyone that was involved wanted to kill people. You know, he thought I was telling st students something that I wasn't. So in my experience, but also in historical experience, it's, it's quality. The arguments for quality, not the arguments that X, this or that is or isn't racist, not the arguments that this or that is good literature, not the arguments that this or that is good or better science, but the argument that whatever we're teaching is the best quality material methods uh, approach. So if I heard you right, our response, our, perhaps our strategic response should be to focus on the overall quality of the district and the programs and the technology and our pedagogy rather than engaging head on with the topic itself? Uh, yeah, so for example, these days we hear a lot about um, do schools or don't schools teach critical race theory because that's what the accusation is. And, and sometimes it's tempting to say, well, we're not, that's not, we're not, we're not doing that. Uh, you know, that's for law school, that's for grad school. Um, to my mind, um, only strategically thinking, uh, the past tells me that getting embroiled, getting into the details of these charges that are not reasonable. So if, if I were trying to defend myself in 1950 Pasadena, to say that I'm not trying to chop down the tree of the American way of life is beside the point. Uh, to say that I'm, I, I'm not a socialist, that's what Rugg came out and said too. I'm not a socialist, I don't wanna do any of that. That hasn't mattered, and I think today it doesn't matter. What has helped and what has mattered is to say, this is the best modern education that your children, our students, that they deserve. And that's, that's the on, our only goal is to give kids the very best education. That's interesting. And, and so to me, that underscores the importance of open house nights at the start of the year and getting parents into the building and you know, uh, positive Facebook posts about, you know, the modern nature of the schools, if we're hearing you right. Yep, I don't know if there's any science teachers in the house, but they can all teach all of us uh, history and English teachers a thing or two, because this has been such a thing in science education yeah. uh, that they have, you know, with creationism and evolution and now climate change education. It's, it's about, uh, to a large me measure, it's about trust. Uh, if students and parents trust teachers, that's the question. Uh, more evidence typically doesn't solve a dispute, but building trust does. And that means outreach to students and parents and 
comments on the report cards and things if I'm hearing you right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Hey, hey, listen, you know, we're a small enough group here um, where I'd like to open up the floor for the last five minutes or so. And please uh, don't hesitate to unmute yourself and, you know, share any thoughts with Adam, Adam directly. Um, you know, we, I don't want to oversimplify your solutions here, but, um, you know, I, I'm hearing for, from you that wading into the cultural wars here um, probably won't work um, historically. That's what we've seen. Yep. Uh, going tit for tat, uh, answering charges directly uh, and trying to prove you're not a socialist, for example, that hasn't mattered. Uh, it hasn't, hasn't changed things. What has changed things is proving that what you're doing is the best, the most modern, uh, the best history. I see uh, Chris has a question. Is that a hand? Yes. Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, and as Drew might have pointed out earlier, um, I wear two hats. I'm a seventh grade social studies teacher in suburban Buffalo, and I'm also on the school board where Drew teaches. Um, in the community, the rural community where I live. So I'm seeing multiple angles of this. Um, and we're seeing particularly um, the open house talk, and, and Drew just brought that up. I was talking with some colleagues today about that, how I fear an open house next year, will we be getting these types of questions? And I really appreciate what you just said, Adam, because part of me wanted to just go on rants of how CRT is just this fake crisis. It doesn't exist K through 12. And I see where you're going with this. I said I would, I could visualize myself now saying, well, do you want your child to be a critical thinker and look at multiple points of view as opposed to trying to rant and just shout down the conservative viewpoints? I, I appreciate that significantly, um, especially because what we're seeing now is um, we have in the school district where I'm teaching three very vocal candidates running for school board. Um, their initial motivation was anti-mask, anti-vaccination, but now they're putting out parent partner curriculum and, and things like that. And, you know, along the lines of we want to approve books, we want to approve, you know, what you're teaching. And to me, that's very scary. And I think that's the next step that we're seeing now in schools is the, the people who had the anti-mask are now moving into this other angle, too. Um, and I think it's becoming that's the next step that we're all going to be facing. Um, so it's, it's scary to me, but I appreciate what you just said, because it gives me a different way of, of thinking it, whether I'm a school board member or um, in the classroom myself. So thank you, appreciate that. The, the, the parents' rights rhetoric, I'm, I'm on board uh, with Chris. I, I, I think, I don't wanna speak for anyone else. I, I, of course, I'm in favor of parents' rights. I want to talk to parents. I reach out to parents. I have a hard time getting a hold of parents. You know, I want, I want parents to know what their kids are doing. And so when I see politicians in Virginia, for example, campaigning and winning on, uh, by saying that you know they're the only people who want to have parents have rights, you know it hurts and it makes me angry. Uh, uh, but um, I, I think that the the idea that only one side, only one party is the party of parental rights, and uh, the other isn't, uh, that's you know it, it just makes you angry and it's tempting to uh, just reply and point out all the things that I do to try to get parental involvement and that I want parental involvement. But that just ends up with us talking about that issue instead of the issue of, you know, what, you know, like, how can we get parents involved? Yes, let's get parents involved. Like, here's, here's our list of things we're trying to get parents to sign up for. You know, like, great, you're involved now. Uh, so I, I, it's a tough one. And it's hard not for me anyway, not to be just personally, like, um, angry and, and offended even. And I think that that's a losing, I mean, a, a losing approach, though, because that's puts the conversation onto the idea that parents are or aren't involved. No, that's a fake conversation. The conversation is, please, let's get parents involved. But these are the things we want to talk about. Um, approving the school budget, approving our need for a new whatever. Let's talk about the things that really matter. Uh, is it, Don, is that a hand? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, wondering what you think the actual motivation of the what's going on in Florida right now actually is. I mean, is, are they just picking a fight? I mean, mm. it's pretty obvious that 41% of math books don't address critical race theory. And if you actually look at the text of that, it, they were dismissed for critical race theory, common core mentioning, you know, using the phrase common core. And um, I think in both cases, the 
people making that argument don't actually know what either of those things really are. But I, uh, it occurs to me that maybe DeSantis is just trying to rile up the base and that works for him. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you, Don, 100%. I think that we got a couple of different, and this is what makes it so difficult to talk about, because there's a couple of different things going on. There's politicians uh, who are, um, and, and pundits, you know, so people who are out to build their brand in one way or another, whether it's through votes or likes or followers or whatever, who are um, sometimes more explicitly, sometimes less explicitly, cynically, exploiting this idea that they know is uh, 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 you know uh, an a thing that parents are anxious about and exploiting that simply to whatever if they're going for votes or likes or whatever um, you know groups that are trying to attract attention they um, make these charges against a host of things science uh, curriculum math curriculum the literature and this is what uh, you know, the, this is so much of the same pattern that's been going on for 100 years, where it's, it's scare tactics that are used to, um, in my opinion, derail, you know, any useful conversation. However, I do think that another part of the, of the um, equation is that sincere parents, or even just citizens, but usually parents, like they really are anxious about uh, what their kids are being taught. Uh, and again, I have 100% sympathy for every parent uh, and citizen, but every parent who wants to feel like they have a voice in their child's public education. I, I agree. And I, I even more so, like, I think that the ideas that motivate a public school, the curriculum that's used in a public school, it's not just what, my, as a classroom teacher, it's not just what I want. Uh, what I think are the important ideas. It's what the community has agreed upon in a variety of ways, like setting the standards, for example, and the, uh, choosing the, the uh, textbooks and the literature lists. Like I uh, agree that, or I acknowledge that not everyone has the same ideas of what we should do in public school. And that's fine, it's great. I, I think that people do have an obvious right to disagree about what should go on in the public schools. Um, but as you say, that I think sincere sort of participatory framework where there's disagreement and there's discussion and there's votes that gets derailed by people like um, like most recently uh, uh, activists like uh, Chris Rufo make no secret of the fact that they don't really care about critical race theory uh, and that he said this publicly this isn't me saying anything he hasn't said already uh, to audiences he said that his only goal is to exploit anxiety and fear to derail public education. And I think when there's, when there's actors like that involved, it makes it very difficult, impossible maybe, it makes it very difficult to have conversations about like, okay, we disagree about, you know, in Florida maybe, we disagree about what a gender identity, what our classes should be teaching about sex ed and gender identity. It makes those vital conversations almost impossible to have because it, just like they did in the 1920s and the 1930s and the 1950s, it attempts to turn teachers into fanatics who are trying to cram ideas down kids' heads, uh, you know, down kids' throats, sorry, uh, and are, you know, like sort of radical activists bent on subverting American values, chopping down the tree of the American way of life. And if, if a parent comes to a meeting with a teacher or a school board, and that's who they think they're talking to, you can't have a productive conversation. So I think the, the building the brand types ruin the, 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 the ability for us to have conversations that we vitally need because we do disagree and we have authentic disagreements, but we can't discuss those um, if they're layered with all these unauthentic disagreements that get put on top uh, and, and, and mixed in. Tom, thank you. And it would be a great discussion with Adam, Don, wouldn't it, on how would be, what would be his suggestions for how uh, climate educators could sell that important message, um, yeah. you know, to parents uh, with, without any friction. You know, Adam, let's go more directly here, though. You know, for when we 
when school boards like Chris's uh, do face criticism or candidates, or we do get those emails, um, you know, you're based upon the history here, you're suggesting that we don't take the bait. And I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems that that's the direction you're heading in. Uh, it is. Um, and, you know, we, you know, so, uh, and I, and I get that this might sound kind of pie in the sky or optimistic or, um, you know, sort of like unaware of what it's like to be, uh, you know, confronted with uh, uh, someone yelling into the mic at, at a school board meeting, or, I mean, we've seen that, you know, the, the episodes of, um, you know, people physically pushing uh, children in some cases with these mass protests and things like that. And so I get that it might seem um, a little beside the point to say not to engage with the fake controversies and keep the discussion on, you know, the, the things that really matter, which is school quality and, and things that we all agree, whatever we think about, you know, sort of culture war issues, we all agree that we want the best schools for the kids. That's, uh, it, it was in the 20th century and it's today. Um, and if we can keep the conversation on what it means to have the best schools, uh, I, I do think that's the answer. But, you know, is it uh, reasonable? Is it real sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, political trench politics to say that we can not um, engage with these distractions? You know, again, I, I spent a lot of my time in, in, in uh, the 20th century, but I, I do think that it is. And I think um, uh, a lot of us know his name if we don't remember his role, but uh, Fiorello LaGuardia, LaGuardia, before he was an airport, uh, he was the mayor uh, and he was a congressperson from Manhattan and he was tough and he was smart. And in the 1920s, when the US Congress, when he was uh, representing uh, New York City, when the US Congress was trying to ban uh, DC teachers from teaching, uh, the, it was supposed to ban evolution from DC schools but also ban any teacher teaching that ours is an inferior form of government. That was the law and it passed in 1924. It was up for renewal in 1926 and LaGuardia spoke against it. And he was no, um, you know, he was no pie in the sky idealist. He was a, a, a brawler politician. And when he made his speech, he didn't respond to these accusations that teachers were in there, um, you know, conspiring or subverting. He focused on the fact that the kids are safe. Uh, he focused on what really mattered in politics, which is that kids are safe and only by learning modern ideas can they be ready for the modern world. And I, I think we can do the same. We can learn uh, uh, from you know, the past to say, uh, we're not gonna talk. And, and again, if, you, <laughs> if you've ever been in a hallway in a middle school and the kids start fighting, it's the first thing you wanna say is like, let's not, get into all this. You know, this is not worth getting into right now. And I think it's the same case, not everyone, but like um, some of the people that Don and Chris mentioned, they come in rhetorical guns blazing and they just wanna fight. Uh, and when that's the case, you're not gonna convince them otherwise, but I think you can convince, um, you know, just, uh, the loud don't make the whole crowd, you know? So it, you can convince the people that really matter that we are fighting for what they really want, which is quality schools. Uh, and I see Marcus as uh, the appropriate size or say parents should have uh, in the education system. I think this is the same question, Drew, that you're raising uh, in a way, which is, you know, to my mind, I, I, I think, you know, parents have every right. And this is what um, is so galling to hear that you know uh, people are against parents, teachers are against parents' rights or parents' intrusion. Um, it's one thing to say, okay, as a teacher, I don't, <laughs> I don't think a parent can bust into my fourth period class and demand that I give them a copy of the lesson plan right there. That's that's ridiculous. That's disruptive. But if a parent uh, wants to talk to us about what we're doing in in the U.S. history curriculum. Great. Uh, here, are the, here are the times and the places we can do it. So the, the size or role and say, I think parents should have every role and say, but they should have it um, not uh, as a sort of um, bully tactic when they demand it, but as part of the processes that are already established. So if, uh, if we have to have long uh, school board meetings 
where pe everyone gets their three minutes at the microphone, uh, we have to. Uh, but what we can't have is someone grabbing the microphone. We can't have um, people pushing their way in and, and seizing the microphone and saying that they're the only ones who get to talk. So I do think it's a tough one and I don't think it's, but I don't think it's um, idealistic or naive to think that arguments for quality are, are too abstract. I think arguments for quality are speaking to the people who really care, which are all the parents who have kids in that school system. <clears throat> hey, well, Adam, it's, it's 10 after eight here. And, uh, you know, we didn't sign up for overtime pay for you, uh, <laughs> even though we know that this is your life's work. And you, you, I'm sure you appreciate this engaged audience here. Um, but I just want to thank everybody and just, you know, formally end the webinar here. And we'll look forward to being in touch about the symposium. And we hope you can all join us a week from tomorrow uh, downtown at Southern Tier. But Adam, what, what other closing thoughts do you have? And um, I'd like to just before I get to you, um, are there any other questions from the audience here? Um, because they've all been fantastic. Adam, back to you. Um, you know what? Uh, you know we 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 had a nice nice conversation tonight, and no no surprise. You know, uh, thank you for your time with us. Um, but you know, we you heard from school board members and classroom teachers, and it seems that you're saying to all of us, be careful, and that you know we can get through this. I, yeah, that that uh, is the 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 lesson of the 20th century, and I don't think. Obviously, everything changes, and this is the wildest, um, you know, last six years politically that that there's uh, been in, in a long time, uh, naturally. And things are different now than they have been. They really are. There's never been this pandemic. There's never been this. Uh, the previous presidency has never been like that. So things are different, uh, but some things are the same. And I think one of the things that's the same, and we see it in polls from the 20th century, we see it in polls today, is that America likes us. <laughs> America wants their kids to have teachers who care about them, who care about their subject, who know about their subject, and are committed to that subject, who go to seminars, you know, on a, on a uh, what, I don't know what day it is, Wednesday, on a Wednesday night, <laughs> because they're so interested in their subject, and they want to talk to other people. This is exactly what America wants, and uh, not everyone, uh, obviously. But just like, I mean, again, for those of you who are teachers, uh, you can think of that class at 25, sure, there's one, maybe two, there's three, but they don't define that class. Uh, that class is 22 other students who really do wanna, you know, they're on board, but those three, and I think that there's a similar case uh, right now and has been in the 20th century. Um, parents want good schools, period. We want good schools. If we can focus on that, and that's huge, we can win every discussion. Oh, I, I, can we talk, Drew? There's a question here from Michael. Of course, yeah. And uh, why 1922? Um, and I'm sure you got the question in front of you, and it, it's a great question, you know, and, and tell us more about your background on choosing that date as a benchmark. Well, mostly because it's a it's it's a, a clean hundred years. Mostly because Willa Cather picked it, but I think um, Willa Cather picked it because actually Scopes was twenty five, uh, but the anti evolution stuff was twenty two. Uh, Kentucky thought about its first law, which which did this: uh, the first anti evolution law in nineteen twenty two. Um, yes, it would have banned evolution from schools and colleges, but this is what blows my mind: it would have banned every book in every public library in Kentucky that would directly or indirectly, and this is how nerdy I am, I can quote this, and it directly or indirectly weaken or undermine the faith, and that's as far as I can quote, of any kid in Kentucky, and they meant Christians. So when we talk about libraries banning books now, when we talk about 850 books that need to be banned from schools, when we talk about ideas that are real ideas, critical race theory is a real idea, but when it's used as a sort of a, like a puppet to scare people, uh, those are the things that started in 1922. That's, I think, uh, how the world broke apart, you know, 
or thereabouts. Thank you for that. And, you know, Don just uh, added a quote about the largest uh, school massacre happening in 1927 by a taxpayer uh, who loaded the school with dynamite. And I, I don't mean to chuckle here, but that's incredible and um, not altogether surprising. Um, you know, uh, so, okay. So, uh, Adam, um, you know, we appreciate your time tonight. And, you know, we'll look forward to you know, keeping close with you and are you active on social media and do you do any posts? I, I know you, you're published a lot, uh, but is there any way we could follow you if, if uh, you're active? I, I am and I'm overactive. I'm hyperactive. You can find me at Adam Lots on Twitter. And, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I post a lot of um, this stuff from the archives, you know, so just this morning, for example, uh, a 1940 uh, 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 conservative American Legion post in, in Kansas City posted what it wanted out of public schools and it was uh, very um, surprising. They wanted well-funded public schools where kids learned a love of learning, art, uh, and I forget the rest of it, but that's me on Twitter. So uh, if, you're, if you're active on Twitter, uh, uh, please do follow. I'll follow you back. It'll be great to get to know you better. Great. That's great. Well, Adam, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your time tonight. And uh, if you'd like to hang out for a second, I'm sure there, there might be a moment for, you know, a question or two from, um, you know, uh, those of us who want to hang around a bit. But uh, thank you all. And we're hoping to possibly do a webinar here in May about the, the rise of uh, right wing extremism in Eastern Europe and how that, uh, you know, best might be taught or contemplated in the classroom. Uh, but uh, we don't have any formal date yet, but I'll be sure to keep in touch. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Adam, you're a joy. And as predicted, you gave us some concrete solutions, which we're so appreciative of. And if you want to hang around for a couple more seconds, please do. But uh, for all of us here at the Academy, thanks so much. And we hope you have a great rest of the school year and we'll look forward to being in touch. Thanks so much.